I know it sounds like we're disagreeing with everything Doug has said on our last interview. You know, we agree 90%. We're on the same page. I mean, the idea of, of paying attention to the biomechanics, protecting the joints, using a speed that's safe, trying to use as little momentum as possible, understanding that, you know, we're trying to get stronger. We're not trying to uh, become a boxer or an athlete. You know, I mean, his idea, his approach to general fitness and, and, and exercise we're a lot closer in agreement than we are in disagreement, I would say. Hello and welcome to the Inform Fitness Podcast with New York Times best-selling author, Adam Zickerman. I'm Tim Edwards with the Inbound Podcasting Network and a client of Inform Fitness. Now here in episode 42, we are welcoming back our guest from episode 20, Bill D. Simone. As you might remember, Bill is a personal trainer himself and the author of the book, Congruent Exercise, How to Make Weight Training Easier on Your Joints. So the reason we invited Bill back to join us is to discuss episode 36 that was released a couple of months ago featuring bodybuilder Doug Brignoli. Doug, too, is an author, and his book is titled Million Dollar Muscle, A Historical and Sociological Perspective of the Fitness Industry. Today, Bill... Adam and Mike will be comparing and contrasting their different methodologies and philosophies regarding weight training with that of Doug's. Interestingly, though, over the past 41 episodes, Doug and Bill's episodes are our top two and most downloaded episodes of the Inform Fitness Podcast. I have a feeling that this one just may surpass both of them. Yeah, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad to be doing this episode right now because it brings up a point about the whole idea of, the, of our podcast in, in, in the first place, which is that I don't want our podcast to be one big advertisement for informed fitness in my business and our one way of thinking. I want to really educate. I want to bring up the points and the things that in exercise that are important to talk about and to try to figure out. There are still a lot of questions in exercise that we don't have answers to. So I like to bring in other opinions that aren't necessarily of my own. And when we had Doug Brignoli on, uh, the bodybuilder, a couple of weeks ago, uh, a lot of people, well, first of all, it was one of our most downloaded episodes. People love that episode. However, the people that know me and my philosophy and have been listening to all the other episodes have said, you know, Adam, did you actually agree with everything Doug was saying? I mean... Uh, he, he seemed to have contradicted you in, in a couple of points there. Uh, what's with that? Because, again, people are perceiving this podcast as just one, maybe one big advertisement for my philosophy. And we don't know everything. And there are big questions out there. And what I wanted to do now, and I, I, want, to, I want to bring Bill D. Simone back, because uh, he also did a biomechanics uh, episode with me. And that was also one of the most downloaded episodes. So, obviously, we're hitting a nerve on this subject. And... I'm doing this not necessarily to show that Doug was wrong, per se, but I'm doing this because I want to point out that everything we're doing, uh, Bill, Doug, myself, we're, we're, we're trying to figure things out. We're still trying to figure things out as we safely apply exercise to our clients and give them what they're looking for. So let's start with one of the subjects that Doug and I had talked about, which was this idea of compound movements versus isolation movements and, and the virtues of both. And so, so why don't we start with that? Yeah, as you said, a compound movement is a multi-joint, multi-muscle movement um, that it, some people refer to as functional, which is absurd because it suggests that something that isn't compound is dysfunctional. <laughs> <laughs> right. But if, that would almost suggest that if you do isolation exercises, somehow your body isn't going to be able to coordinate all of its various muscle strains at the same time. It's absurd. I mean, y yes, it's true that if you're doing dead hand cleans, you get skilled at doing dead hand cleans. Right. So that doesn't necessarily mean that you can cross that over into something that doesn't look anything like a dead hand clean. Just means you're learning a skill. You're learning to coordinate all of the muscles that participate in that movement in a particular event. But it, but the idea that the, that it's a compound movement would then make you better able to use those participating muscles as a, as compared to isolation exercises has no logic in it whatsoever. You that, now you agree with that for the most part, right? You know when when he says compound movements, though, I'm not sure if he's referring to the circus tricks people do. In the name of functional exercise, you know, uh, combining no, a, a squat or a... 
I think what he's really talking about is just your real basic compound movements, leg press, chest press, I would say pull down compared to uh, leg extension, leg curl, uh, hip hip extension, bicep curl, bicep curl. I'm not really sure where he where he's going with that because, like, what's the context for this? I mean, I mean, who is claiming that compound movements are you know better or making you more coordinated? Like his his whole point is compound movements are inefficient. If by compound movements we're talking about, he's he's, he's basically saying the function uh, compound movements are, are considered like functional movements, and that you need to do compound movements because the, it, it helps the muscles work together. It, the muscles learn to work together in a compound movement. And the argument is that if you're only doing isolation movements or doing isolation movements, you're not, you, the muscles aren't learning to work together. Well, the, 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 fir- the, 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 the first problem, though, is there is no muscle isolation. You're isolating a joint, okay? But no matter how much you think there's an isolation, happen- it's more like emphasis, because other muscles are helping stabilize and they're assisting even in a single joint movement so there's no real isolation he's really everything he's talking about as you know because you listen to the whole thing everything he's talking about is really about um muscle development hypertrophy uh efficiency right so getting max well, mechanical but, but, but that's really the context though is it's we're talking about talking about bodybuilding and muscle develop too right yeah right we are I mean, yeah, that's what but, we do too. That's where right. some of the disconnect is. I mean, like, again, his argument is that compound movements aren't going to be as beneficial for muscular development because you're on a squat, for example, you know, the lot of the quadriceps are not going to get the full amount of that load. They're going to get 30% of that load on a set. So the quads are going to get 30% of that load based on uh, direction of the forces, you know, the force going through the tibia to the floor. Well, uh, let's let's talk about that then, because because in that case I don't agree with it at all. Well, that's well he that's that's Tim. Go to three. Can you go to three? I can't. Like a lamp post is vertical because a lamp post is vertical to gravity, and so it's balanced over its base. But if you tried to anchor that lamp post at a forty five degree angle, you'd have to bolt it down to the ground with a lot more force, a lot more bolts, because now it wants to fall. Okay, so a, a lever that mm-hmm. is parallel to gravity or whatever resistance is, is going to be a zero neutral lever and one that is perpendicular to gravity or whatever you happen to be using for resistance is going to be what I call a 100% lever, a maximally active lever. So when you look at a squat and you realize that the lower leg is the operating lever of the quadricep and you realize that it doesn't even reach a 45 degree angle, you say, well, it's actually closer to neutral than it is to fully active. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, identifying the levers is, is half the discussion. All right? So when, when the femur, for instance, is horizontal in the bottom of a squat, that is where the resistance is working through its biggest lever. But that's only half the story because where, where that hits in the muscle torque curve is also important. So when you go from standing in a squat where there's zero resistance moment arm, and so no work to, to oppose, and yeah. now you squat down to where your femur is horizontal and you have a maximum resistance moment arm. For the, for the uh, hip extensors, not, not, not the knee extensors. It's, no, it's, it's a both. It's a both. I mean, it's, 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 it's murky because it's not as clean a look as in a um, single joint. But when your femur is horizontal in a squat and the, and the weight's going down perpendicular to it yeah the weight's going down somewhat in the middle of the femur yeah with, with a slight, in other words a slight, if it's on your shoulders if it's on your shoulders and you're bending with, over. yes let's let's paint the, the a lot of this stuff works better in diagrams and print but yeah. to, to paint the picture there's a barbell on your back when you're standing upright that the line of that weight is going through all of your joints so there's no lever created for the weight to for you to work against, right? As far as the weight's concerned, and now as you descend, and your femur goes horizontal and your torso leans forward a bit, your center of gravity is splitting the femur horizontally, so that is the biggest resistance moment arm for both the glutes and the quads. Mm-hmm. So that's the mechanically hardest part of the squat, the sticking point. 
but it also happens to be very close to the joint angles for peak muscle torque for both the quads and the glutes. Where so the, that's, in other words, where the muscles are can generate the most power, their most power, the most strength. Right. So you see, the, the, the more visible lever is the one that the resistance works through. But internally, depending on where, where you are in a, joint's, um, in a joint's range, you have varying degrees of muscle torque. So identifying the lever is half of it, but knowing that it hits at the right point in the muscle's strength is the other half. Mm -hmm. Now, in something like a barbell squat, leaving other joint concerns out of it, if you don't lock out at the top and you don't bottom out, if you go from that almost locked out to the femur being horizontal. Almost effort, horizontal. Or, sorry, approximately horizontal. Yeah. Your, effort, your effort feels very even. There's no sticking point and there's no mm -hmm. lockout. All right? So that makes an efficient exercise. So There's no place yes. to rest. There's no place for the muscle to hide. So it's not necessarily less efficient than a leg extension. Gotcha. Since you can't lock out in a leg extension, it's very obvious, and your quads are burning, say, by the first rep or two. It's very obvious how efficient that is. You make a little tweak to a squat or a leg press, and it's just as efficient. Where it gets inefficient is when you lock out or you bottom out. So just like you wouldn't rest the weight stack on a leg extension to take a break to do another repetition, um, if you don't lock out in the, in the squat or the leg press, you're, you're not giving yourself that rest. So as far as which is more, more efficient, you know, you could make the argument that the squat's more efficient because you're also working the glutes at the same time. Um, but you also are performing at their, uh, appropriately at their muscle torque at the right time. Right. Now, that's putting aside all the other joint issues with those exercises. Yeah, like so, the lower back. Like the lower back. So but but also the knee and the knee and the leg extension. So I mean my um approach to compound versus or multi multi joint versus single joint movements mm -hmm. is both you, you need to be aware of the vulnerable joint positions in both of them. So to me the issue is which is the easier workaround. And that might be different based on your your client. I know if I personally barbell squat my back's going to bother me even though I know what ranges I want to stay in. So to me, the easier workaround is to just go to the leg press. But for somebody who has the technique down of a barbell squat or, um, you know, and if they're back and handle it, and if they're staying well within their, their, their margin of error, maybe it works for them, which is a little bit different than, you know, trying to correlate like a, a hang clean or any of these more explosive movements and trying to relate that to, to, to a wellness program. In, the, in that terms, I agree with them completely. There, there's no, there's no reason for be, people to be doing ballistic type stuff unless that's your sport. You know, unless your sport is Olympic lifting and you have to learn how to clean. I guess you know something. You know, we're talking about like you know, I think you know Adam sort of mentioned numbers and Doug talked about it in his in the podcast also about percentages. The per, and like you know I guess it, it's hard. It's difficult to discuss how what percentage of the quadriceps are being recruited when you do a squat versus the percentage of the quadricep when you're doing the leg extension, like 90% versus 60%, that type of thing. And I guess, you know, like, uh, I mean, Doug comes from a bodybuilding background. Are his arguments more appropriate for that type of setting? And let's just say, he, like, he is right, and the leg extension is much more efficient than, like, a like our simple movement is made more efficient than a compound movement. Does it matter anyway for like muscle development for general fitness anyway? And they and there's and there's a real question: Why is the person working out? So, in other words, if someone's in a in a, a wellness mindset. Oh. In other words, they want to work out so that they get through the physical parts of their day better and their joints don't hurt, and maybe they fit into clothes better and they look more toned. There's no need for them to take a bodybuilder's approach to, you know, I have to get this muscle as bunched up as possible. <laughs> but also, there's no need for that person, say our client, to put their joints at any more risk than they need to. So... If someone wants to be a power lifter or wants to be a bodybuilder and they're convinced that the barbell squat is the greatest thing they can do for themselves, you're probably not going to convince them not to. But there's probably no reason for somebody who doesn't have any ambitions in the barbell squat to subject the rest of their joints to that type of risk. Understood. I agree. 
you know, so, some of the content of your last podcast, though, a, a lot of it has to do with the context. So he's obviously from the bodybuilding world, and what he sees going on in bodybuilding gyms are probably much different from my context, whereas I'm in a studio like you guys. So I'm not really exposed to a lot of the trendier parts of the fitness industry to react against. I mean, I can just look at a technique or an exercise and figure out if it's useful and use it or not. I'm not seeing it every day. For instance, in my studio, nobody's doing a dead hang clean anyway. <laughs> so, you know, you know, we have a little different context for the, for the comment. Yeah, I think like, I think sometimes exercise programs, you know, we think about it and I think sometimes we're, we might be thrown into that category sometimes too, because we want to see our, our clients progress and be able to do more. You know, it shows them that they're getting stronger if they lift 50 pounds and then 60 pounds and then 80 pounds and so on. Is that an appropriate goal for a general exercise program to just be able to get the maximum out of whatever your muscle can do, you know, and how much do you want to balance that with, you know, uh, what the joint may or may not be able to do, you know, and how far do you want to test it? In a way, I guess in a way. Well, I mean, I, I would say protecting the joint is, is number one, but then again, that's my, I, that is my thing. And I would say most of our listeners are of that ilk. I mean, they're, they're, we're not. I don't think too many bodybuilders are listening to this po <laughs> these podcast episodes. Probably sure. right, right. Um, Unless some of Doug's friends tuned into that interview. <laughs> which he, I think he got a lot of people to listen to it, though. <laughs> yes, he did. So along the same lines, uh, I'd like to kind of have you comment on this because I think I think the answer is the same when he talks about tricep pushdowns versus dips. So can you play that clip, uh, Tim? Um, getting back to what we were talking about before about parallel levers versus perpendicular levers, when you see someone doing a bench dip or a parallel bar dip and you notice that their forearm is almost vertical, it only breaks from the neutral vertical position by about 11 degrees. Which so means about the tricep, which, 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 which means your is, tricep is only getting about 11%. Right. 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 So here's the math I do on that. As I say, if you're a 180 pound guy and you want to figure out how much load each tricep is going to get, you say, okay, I'm 180 pounds. I'm going to divide that by two arms. That's 90. The length of your forearm is about a 12 to one ratio. So you have a magnification of 12. So you say 90 times 12 times 11% active lever gives you about 119 pounds of load per tricep at a cost of 180 pounds of effort. But if that same person were to lie on a flat bench with a pair of 20-pound dumbbells Skull where, the crushes, forearm, yeah. where the pair of forearm does actually cross gravity at 100%, you do the same math. You say 20 pounds times 12 times 100% is 240 pounds of load per tricep at a total cost of 40 pounds. Right? So this is efficiency. Why would you bother – doing an exercise that costs you 180 pounds of effort, but only loads your tricep with 119 pounds, when you can do 40 pounds of cost and 240 pounds of load, and it's not like it's working a different head of the tricep. Right. All three heads are working in both ways. It's just that they're, they have drastically different efficiencies. Well. <laughs> How does that I'll, add up, Bill? I'll, I'll, I'll take his word for it on the calculations. Yeah. Uh, you followed him on that, right? I followed it. I didn't necessarily agree with it, but I, fo I, I followed where he was going. But again, now, so, so this is along the lines of what we were talking about before, correct? It's, 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 the, it's the same thing. The choice between skull crushes and dips is, are your elbows healthier than your shoulders? That's the, that's the choice. <laughs> okay. Let's leave the joint issues aside. If you dip till your elbows at 90 degree bend and your elbows are towards the rear with your torso held somewhat vertically. And at that 90 degree bend, now you, you straighten your elbows and almost lock out. That's a pretty good match for how the resistance lever changes according to your muscle torque for the triceps. The same thing with, the, with skull crushes. The 90 degree bend is your maximum moment arm, and then if you stop short of locking out, you're keeping some of the um, uh, resistance torque on the triceps. So that's also a good match. Let me just explain that real fast. So when you're doing skull crushes and you have your, your forearms parallel to the ground. Correct. 
all right, and you have weight at the end of your hands, all right, you're multiplying that weight by the longest lever, the whole length of your forearm, which That's is correct. the heaviest that weight is at that moment. Well, that also happens to be at the 90 degree angle of your elbow. That also happens to be the strongest part of your tricep. That's when your tricep is at its strongest. As you lift the weight, the lever changes, meaning the weight gets lighter because the lever shortens as you go up, which is okay because the tricep strength, muscle torque actually is also decreasing, right? Decreasing. Right. That's the skull crushers. Now, is the same thing happening during dips? With the, now, with the dips, okay, when your elbow is bent at 90 degrees, not necessarily your shoulder, so mm -hmm. your elbow is a little bit behind your torso. If you stop there, that's the biggest resistance moment arm for your body weight in the dips, all right, without tearing your shoulders out. And now, as you straighten your, your elbows, the resistance lever is shrinking, and it's matching what your triceps can do. Now, a couple of things about what you said there. When your forearm is horizontal, it's heaviest. See, that's, that's the whole thing with levers and moment arms, right? It's not heavier. It's the same dumbbell. No, of course. It, it, okay. the torque, Te the torque, technically, the, it's the resistance the torque. The resistance torque, the foot pounds, is increased. Now, here's the problem with both of those exercises. Conventionally, you start both of those exercises where the, where the resistance torque is lightest. You start both of those exercises with your arms locked. So it's very easy... To fool you yourself, think you can handle weight. more weight, yeah. Exactly. You use too much weight, and as soon as your elbows bend, now the bigger lever, now the bis bigger resistance moment arms kick in, and now it becomes unmanageable. Th this lever, the levers in the moment arm, it's not just theoretical, it's got a very real practical effect, especially when you start the exercise with the smallest resistance lever. When they're, when they're choosing a weight, they choose a weight and they start with their arms locked out, which doesn't feel like a lot of resistance. It can right. be a lot of it can be a lot of weight, but it's since your the weight is right it's over your elbow and straight right. arm, you're not really feeling that resistance yet. As soon as you bend back, if you pick the weight that's too heavy for your triceps to handle, you're gonna you're gonna literally crush, crush your skull. skull. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, so, the name. so yeah, so the technique should be this: if you're gonna do skull crushes, pick a weight that feels appropriate. At the 90 degree angle, not not at the top angle, not at the top. Well, the thing to do would be to try to either start at the bottom so you know right away the weight's too heavy, right? So if you're using dumbbells for skull crushers, for instance, you start on the floor and you start with the dumbbells by your ears as yeah, you're lying on the floor, yeah. and now you'll know right away if it's too heavy. Or, you know, the trainer or the the person doing the exercise the first time you do it you have to guess light yeah because that, it doesn't take that, you know that's the key you guess light when you don't know you gotta go light, right. you gotta think like really really light when any client asks me how to advise them on a uh, at a travel gym or somewhere there where they're out of i said listen you know unless it's the exact same thing you don't know especially if it's on a machine you have to you have to just guess light and uh and and work up from there Particularly and, when uh, there's like that timber effect that you have to worry timber. about. Uh, nice quote. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I got that from you. It was in the moment arm exercise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I steal a phrase while I'm interviewing the person that came up with it. Nice. Not, good not good, good one, though. Oh, it, it's flattery. <laughs> By the way, that dynamic, we, when we talk about going from the easy part of an, starting with the easy part of the exercise, progressing into the hard part or zero moment arm to maximum moment arm, that is predictable. I mean, you can know that before you do it, but you have to make a point of, of studying it, you know, reading moment arm exercise or, or, or the biomechanics chapters in virtually any personal training certification will give you enough information to know what's happening. I think most people look at the exercise in a magazine or look at somebody in the gym doing the exercise and just try to copy what they see. So moving on to some other points, Doug is of the opinion that, for again, for muscle hypertrophy, for muscle development, that static exercises are inferior to dynamic exercises, that, that if you really want to build muscle, statics are not enough. And let's listen to what he has to say. There have been a number of studies that have shown that isometric exercise is far less productive both from the perspective of developing a muscle, enlarging the muscle, and from the perspective of gaining strength through a muscle's entire range of motion. It gains strength right where you're holding it. 
it does it gains a little strength in the other parts of the range of motion, but not nearly as much. So if you want strength, if you want what let's use the word functional strength, strength through a muscle's entire range of motion, you're better off using range of motion, right? So is there a place for isometric? Sure. If you have an injured joint, rehab, then you use it as part of your rehabilitation. But this idea that, that we're going to do planks as the best exercise for the abs would be like saying, well, let's just do static everything then. Let's just do static wall squat where you just hold the squat position. Let's just do static barbell hold. Let's just do static pectoral hold. I mean, if it's good for one, it's good for all. If it's not good for one, it's not good for all. All right. Okay. So, 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 so I heard that and I was like, well, it was the first time I kind of really heard that. I mean, and, and I've always wondered about, you know, is dynamic exercise better than statics? I mean, you know, I have a lot of clients do planks and it is metabolically demanding, but maybe, I don't know, maybe he, he's, I mean, he's a bodybuilder, right? So he spent the last 40 years playing around with, with maximizing his hypertrophy. And, uh, do you think he has some insights that us mere mortals don't have? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Going to the bodybuilding, right? Yeah. Just from observation, there does seem to be something about moving your limb in space mm -hmm. that works. And whether it's going to failure or the pump or whatever the mechanism is, clearly most guys were overdeveloped are moving weights in space. Okay. Uh, or maybe it has to do with accumulating lactic acid and prompting hormonal changes. But let's go to the end of that passage where he talks about planks. And if it's good for one muscle, it's good for all. The difference between planks and other, abdominal core, exercise, other yeah. core and abdominal exercises, their job is to prevent unwanted movement, not necessarily to create movement. So elsewhere in the podcast, he says that the, the primary role of the abdominals is to move your, your hips and ribs closer together. But really, the <laughs> hips coming up to the ribs, not the other way around. Because he was defining why you call something the origin and why you call something the, the insertion. I'll deal with that in a minute. But, but let's uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. But let, let, let's just go back to the second here. Okay. Sorry as a body, that. as a bodybuilder, though, he thinks in terms of limbs moving, right? Yes. Curls, pectorals, uh, lats, quad, etc. The limbs are moving. When you're getting into planks, though, the role of the abdominals isn't necessarily to bring the hips and ribs closer together, except in a sneeze or a cough. The role of the, the abdominals to, is to prevent hyperextension of the back. Because if you get forced into hyperextension, you hurt, you hurt your back, whatever mechanism. So the role of the front of the abdominals is to prevent hyperextension. The role of the um, multifidus and the rotators around the spine isn't to create a twist around the spine, which would wring out the discs, which is pretty much universally um, contraindicated for spine health, the role of those muscles is to prevent twisting. So the more appropriate way to exercise those muscles is with a plank or is with uh, some kind of static hold because that's how they're going to have to function. But when you're doing a plank, are you talking about it is appropriate for the abs for the plank? Yes. Or are you talking about yeah. But I th but it's the it's the spinal muscles that are really stabilizing during the plank. I mean the abs too, of course. Uh, elsewhere in that podcast, he talked about doing a leg raise and the psoas pulled on the on the vertebrae, yes. creating more of an that's arch in the lower back. But that's only half of what happens there, Mike. You in that podcast, you said, "What if you maintain a posterior pelvic tilt?" And that and that's the key there. If you use your abdominals to pull your hips into a posterior tilt. In other words, you're flattening the curve of your back against the spine. Mm -hmm. And now you're doing the leg raise and your spine doesn't move. Now you're using the abdominals to stabilize the spine. There's nothing raising, wrong with that. The, the raising of the leg just gives you a bit of a, a flow in the exercise, okay? And that, and that you have something to count or you move it from an easier position where your legs are straight up to a harder one where they're more horizontal. But that is a stabilizing exercise and it's using the front of the abdominals in practice a two-leg raise both legs at the same time is probably too hard for most people to do and maintain that posterior tilt which is why you see things like single leg raises and dead bug exercises come out of physical therapy but the whole idea of using your abdominals to create the posterior tilt and then moving your legs that's valid that's legit 
as far as stabilizing the spine and, and using your abdominals appropriately. Now, it may be that planks won't give you protruding abdominals, like that protruding six-pack. And just from observing bodybuilders over time, and they're pumping their biceps, and they have a bicep that lifts off their arm like a softball, <laughs> and all, most of us high-intensity guys have something on our upper arm, but it's certainly not, uh, you know, I don't name a current bodybuilder. <laughs> so maybe the, I, can't. The, I, can't, I, can't, I can't either i can't either <laughs> so maybe moving the moving the hips towards the ribs with force is what gives you that maybe but by whatever mechanism it gives you those protruding abdominals but as far as training the spine appropriately uh, the, the abdominals appropriately to stabilize the spine planks are fine Pl planks are are appropriate so when he makes a blanket statement that uh if dynamic movement is good for one muscle it's good for all that might not be true because, you know, some muscles are meant to be stabilized, but they're not primary movers. So strengthening them might not require any dynamic movement. And again, keeping the bodybuilding context, most of what bodybuilders are talking about are the, the superficial muscles that give your body shape. They're talking about deltoids, pectorals, lats, biceps, triceps, quads, glutes, those muscles that are supposed to move limbs or propel you in space probably are best trained with movement as opposed to the muscles uh, around your spine, the uh, deep muscles in your hips, uh, rotator cuff, whose main job is to hold the, the posture steady. So you really think that, let's say for the deltoids, uh, the lateral deltoids, do you really do think like a lateral raise uh, going through a safe range of motion is is better than doing a static hold lateral raise for muscle development? Do I think so? Not necessarily. I mean, is there are there, are there studies that compare statics versus dynamic for a particular muscle group? I will say from a um, practical point of view, if you're using an isometric for, uh, uh, let's say using it for a biceps, right? I do think there's a difference between pulling against something as hard as you can in terms of straining the joint straining one point in the articulation as opposed to resisting a negative for a minute. They're both static. One, I think, is harder on the joints than the other. But as far as which is better for the muscle, I, I couldn't even guess. Well, a lot of people that kind of feel strongly one way or the other on this, and I don't know what they're basing it on. Which well, okay. Is yeah, yeah. I'll <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know either. I'm. Let's put it this way. I do think, it, I, in a non-therapy setting, okay, because because if you're in rehab, it, it the calculation is different. In a non-therapy setting, I I do think the more appropriate way to train the bigger, more superficial muscles is with some kind of movement, whether it's single joint or multiple joint, and the muscles around the core with static static contractions. Um, because that's how they'll fun that's how they'll function in life, right? If you go to lift something out of the trunk of your car, something heavy, uh, a bag, you lean over. You want your back to stay steady, while your glutes and your arms do the lifting. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be whipping kettlebells around and doing silly human tricks to train functionally. You can also just be maintaining your posture while you're lifting weights, because that's how it's supposed to work. Right. Yes, yeah, so we talked about that on a, a recent episode. Um, exactly that, the idea of of mimicking those movements, you know, in the gym, because you happen to do it once in a while outside of the gym. Bill, what do you uh, just in light of what you just said in regards to you know stabilizing core muscles? Um, what's your just overall view on the rotary torso exercise? as far as uh, strengthening obliques, multipedi, abdominals? Well, I think you have to be careful that your obliques, which are going to help you twist. In other words, the part of the twist that's bringing your shoulder forward can easily overpower the, parts around, the muscles around your spine that bring the other shoulder backward. So if you're doing the rotary torso, you don't really want the person twisting in other words, you don't want them pulling back as much as they're pushing forward, just so that you don't overpower those back, th th those deep spine muscles. It's, it's for instance, the old-fashioned floor crunch where you did like a little twist on the way up. Mm -hmm. You didn't really pull the bottom shoulder backwards, so you never twisted your back right. on that exercise. 
on a rotary torso, again, if someone's overly enthusiastic, and in addition to pushing forward, they're trying to pull back, like in a dumbbell row, like a, like a, a lawnmower. You know that lawnmower yeah, motion? Yeah. Pull, yeah. I could easily see the forward motion overpowering the back motion, and now you're back in the position of ringing the discs. So um, I think in terms of coaching people on it, I think as long as they feel both sit bones on the seat, in other words, as far as they can go without moving the sit bones off the seat. Mm-hmm. Right? So if, if one sit bone li- lifts off, you know they're twisting a little too much. If, they, if both sit bones are in, intact, their range of motion yeah. is going to be less, but it's going to be a little safer. Would you uh, ever, pre- I mean, uh, what do you think about just like maybe even like getting them rotated, say, whatever, 25, 30 degrees and just holding it at that position? Under tension. Under tension. With, a, ba- they with a band or for- something. Well, like I said, 25, 30 degrees. I, I, I think 25 degrees of rotation, 25 to 30 degrees of rotation is the right amount. More is not better. Right. That's, so I if someone agree. tries to go further than that, then then they're they're flirting with with trouble. Um, that's the uh, that's the you know going you know trying to recreate the golf swing things like that. Where how far do you actually train mm-hmm. rotate uh, whatever the the muscles that you want to be strong or stable when you have to actually do a rotating movement in order to do something that you want to do. You know. Well, I think I I, I think I wrote somewhere that. Um, Practicing bad biomechanics doesn't make you invulnerable, right? You're just wearing out that joint faster. A golfer, for instance, to practice that extreme swing beyond what you have to do on the course is just adding more bad sw- more bad movements to his back. Right. So for training purposes, and then adding right? resistance to it also. <laughs> resistance and reps and speed, probably right. Right. Um, so I don't know if you do. You remember Don Mattingly years ago? You know, um, New Yorkers, of course. Yeah, yeah no, well, I figured I'd get away with that reference. I was still, I was still a Yankee fan. Tim's in L.A., we, man, so the, he coached the Dodgers too. So we've lost. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, at the end of his career, he said, you know, his back went out, and he said, "Yeah, I've been, yeah. I, I've That's been why doing he's not this exercise right now. I've been doing this exercise for for twenty years, and and I was never, you know, <laughs> it's never hurt before. Well, okay, so you're doing whatever you're doing, plus thousands of swings on the field." You only get so many bad movements out of your back, so you can either waste them in the in the gym or in competition. Yeah, he reached. He obviously reached his limit. Like you would never tell a guy like that never twist, but if anybody like that ever asked me, I would look at what they were doing in the gym and steer them away from the stuff that is clearly contradictory with, with regard to joint safety well, in the gym. Said- my 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 uh, comment was more rhetorical uh, about like associating with golf, but I wanted to bring it up because it's what I think a lot of our listeners and a lot of people still think about trying to strengthen their backs or uh, increase their range of motion in order to efficiently and hopefully safely do a golf swing. And uh, you know, just bringing up rotary torso as an exercise, which uh, people, you know, some people just love to feel because, oh my God, my obliques are feeling it. And other and, people and, want and they to. want to go to the extremes of that range of motion. They love that yeah. stretch, which I never let them go right. into. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, the reason why I, I, I actually, you know, something, I don't know if I read it or if I just thinking common sense wise, you know, when I want someone to do a rotary torso at, with range of motion, uh, it usually wouldn't, you know, go b- beyond about 25 to 30 degrees, uh, and oftentimes less, you know, and oftentimes uh, even less than that. Um, but I just wanted to get your opinion on based on what we were talking about in regards to the static core type of stuff, and if that's if you think that is actually better for creating stability for uh, a golf swing. Yes, but it's also worth working on range of motion, just not with weights. Correct. Right, mm-hmm. right, right. Yes. Okay, and that's where, whatever you want to call it, body work, stretching, if, if someone's into yoga. I mean, there, there is something to be said about trying to increase your range of motion, but, but not with weights. Right. Yeah, you know, I, 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 yeah, go ahead. The, the, old, um, the old, very old Nautilus idea that strengthen your muscles safely and then practice so your body learns how to use your muscles, I think that's still good. I agree. Yep. Yeah. 
the uh, honestly, from a training perspective, uh, the, the the thing I encourage is a, like if your golf swing is your golf swing and you need to be at a certain point on the backswing and you need to be at a certain point at, on your follow through. Uh, I've literally just recommended a very slow motion swing to the point slow motion where you get to the point of your maximum backswing where that ever that is with whatever limitations your body has and then very slowly bringing the club through you know so you're not actually adding ex, you know this projectile force uh you know rotating with your body it's you like know? tai chi style but it's just inev- inevitably it's what you just said it's just kind of like getting your body used to being in this quote unquote extended range of motion position that golf requires and and what adam just said about tai chi style so th- the idea is you do it in slow motion so your body knows how to do it safely right and then when you do it live your body has done it before Right, it has like a it, it walked before it ran. So it, you know, it's it's like um, if someone's playing volleyball or playing basketball, they should be doing some kind of jumping drill, not for conditioning, but just so that they they know how to land safely. Right. And then Which when is, they have so, to do yeah. it in the competition, it's not a shock. Right. Right. Yeah. So Which is not that's, who, that's it, something that's actually yeah. I, that's for such an interesting point because especially mm-hmm. for sports, because everyone always measures how high you can jump, but not exactly how well you can actually safely land. Landing's a lot more important than jumping. Your it? longevity and being able to do the activity, the landing is infinitely more important than the, the height that you could actually achieve on the jump. <laughs> that's a good point. It's not the fall, it's a sudden stop. <laughs> yeah. It's it's not how much you make; it's how much you keep. Yeah. yeah, so yeah there's, there's, a, there's a comedian. There's a comedian who said, uh, "You just reminded me of it. it. It's it's a stretch right now, pun intended." Ah! <laughs> uh, but uh, he said, uh, "Like uh, you know, they got cars nowadays that get from zero to sixty in four point two seconds. Because I don't need that. I need a car that gets me from eighty eight to fifty four in one second. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <You know? laughs> I don't even know who said it. That's a good point. (laughs) So this reminds me of something else that came up while I was interviewing Doug uh, regarding sports-specific training. I would say if you're sports conditioning, you want to mimic your sport as much as possible. The problem is that a lot of people fantasize about being a sportsman of some sort. And then in the real world, they don't actually do it. In other words, they'll train like a boxer, but they're never really going to box. Right? They just like the idea that they're training like a boxer. Right. OK, if you're if your idea of working out is mostly fun, then that's great. But um, if you're let's say you're lying on your flat on your back with a pair of 20 pound dumbbells and you're going to explode with those 20 pound dumbbells up, you're going to basically catapult those 20 pound dumbbells up. Right. And that's going to pull your arms up. So if your objective is to gain strength, basic usable strength, I would say always use uh, a, a deliberate speed not an explosive speed. Control it up, control it down. If your goal, if your niche is so specific that you want to compete in boxing, you want to compete in tennis, then you do want to actually mimic what you're doing. But uh, my observation has been that, especially in men, they have this fantasy that they want to be a 400 pound bench presser, they want to be a boxer, they want to be a swimmer, they want to be you know, a surfer, and they want to and there's only so many hours in the day. You can't spend three hours. I mean, you got to work, you got to sleep, you probably have a job and family, and you know, you got to pick and choose. You can't do it all, right? True, but like <laughs> you, you're not saying. However, uh, let me just let me just make sure I'm clear on what you're saying because if you we have clients that are are, are true athletes, you know, okay, they're, they're, right. they, they're amateur athletes, and let's say you have a tennis player. You're not suggesting that we kind of mimic uh, with weights in the weight room uh, a, a tennis stroke just to just to improve their their tennis stroke, are you? I would say that that could be part of what you do, not all of what you do. But I would definitely, if I had a tennis, a competitive tennis athlete, I would definitely work specifically on, let's say, a backhand, trying to mimic some resistance on the backhand, so he's getting an, an improvement of power on the backhand or on an overhand. I mean, you don't want these people to go out on the court or wherever they're going, and then 
Why you don't you just have... strengthen their? Why don't you just strengthen their deltoids that are involved in this, and and you know the posterior delts, and anterior delts, uh, congruently, you know, according to muscle and joint function, and then them, let them go out on a tennis court and start playing tennis. That that, that that would work also, but I'm just saying that if I had a tennis athlete, mm-hmm. I, it, it wouldn't hurt to also incorporate some very very specific. I would say maybe 10 percent, 15 percent of how I would train them might be mimicking certain, especially if they have a weakness in a particular part of their game. I, I think, I think it, it would hurt. I think Darden years ago pointed out that you don't practice for tennis by playing badminton. You know, <laughs> like the, if the movement is similar, it just throws you off for the real movement. Some of that conditioning is more appropriately done on the tennis court than in a weight room. Um, I, I, would, I would do what you suggested, you know, strengthen the, the rotator cuff and the shoulders. Um, Strengthen everything safely, and then, you know, go play tennis. Practice, practice and drills, drills yeah. with the with with the ball, right? But you know, but uh, um, if you ever hear uh, like a any hit influenced, say college strength coaches, they'll also admit that people around them want to see this type of behavior, right? They they don't want to see an empty weight room because everyone got their workout done in twenty minutes is now off killing time. You know, they want to see people running with parachutes and, and um, you know, doing all the different stunts because it looks like something's happening. So yeah, they got to just the, the athletic trainers have to they have just to justify their, their existence. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> say. I know it's it's but, you know, the thing is, uh, I know it sounds like we're disagreeing with everything Doug has said on our last interview. But like as, as you and I talked about offline uh, not too long ago, Bill, you know, we agree 90 percent. We're on, we're, on, we're on the same page. I mean, the idea of, of paying attention to the biomechanics, protecting the joints, using a speed that, that's safe, trying to use as little momentum as possible, understanding that, you know, we're trying to get stronger. We're not trying to uh, become a boxer or an athlete. You know, I mean, his idea, his approach to general fitness and, and, and exercise, uh, you know, we're a lot closer in, in agreement than we are in disagreement, I would say. Wouldn't you? Well, uh, the difference between, practically between what he does, what I do, what you do, what other HIT practitioners do, the difference between all of us is nothing compared to the difference between us and CrossFit and boot camps, <laughs> right? I mean, we're talking about shades of difference. You know, in my case, you know, maybe, maybe trimming off parts of the extreme range of motion that some HIT guys might be doing, which is really, really nuanced differences compared to running people until they puke, for instance, or barking at them to do more burpees, regardless of their form, regardless of their posture, you know, regardless of what's happening to the person's joints, but they hit a number. So high five them. So before we wrap up, there is one more thing that I want to talk about, uh, which was interesting to me. Uh, it, it's, it's about intensity and recovery. And I'd like to play, I'd like to play a clip from that. There is a right level of intensity. Um, in my book, I have a chart where I show what happens if the intensity level is too low, what happens if it's too high, and what happens if it's just right. And it, clearly, just right has nothing but benefit. But if it's too low, you won't get the benefit. If it's too, too high, it's like getting a sunburn. In other words, instead of giving you stimulation, you get injury. And when you have an injury, you actually basically have to heal so some people think, hey, if I work out super intensely and I just work a body part once a week, in other words, take a longer amount of time between workouts, I can compensate for the high intensity. No, you cannot. It doesn't work that way. You can't. It's not like recovery time is the great equalizer. Like if you do more frequency, you can do super low intensity. Or if you do super high intensity, just take a little extra time and everything will be fine. No, pretty much the way the body works is when you work a muscle, you're going to have somewhere between a two-day and four-day amount of recovery, after which comes what they call supercompensation. That's when the muscle is getting stronger, right? So the goal is to not work that muscle again, assuming you've worked it relatively hard, to not work it until you've passed recovery and have gotten into supercompensation. So Bill, it seems that that Doug is uh, recommending for most people about two or three days recovery. And he doesn't think that if you work out like super hard going to muscle failure and everything uh 
where you're going maybe 10 seconds beyond positive failure, for example, uh, with maximal effort, that if you do that once a week, you, you, you can't make up for that high intensity by just having extra rest. And a lot of, as you know, a lot of hit facilities, high intensity training facilities are recommending a lot of people work a full body compound movements, six or seven exercises, complete failure, take a week off. Do, do, I mean, where, where do you like, where do you sit on the intensity versus recovery continuum, if you will? I understand the theory because Mentzer used to, Mentzer said the similar things 35, 40 years ago uh, about not working out until you were fully recovered. But you know, then then it got ridiculous where where he's suggesting work out once every three weeks. You know, stretching the recovery out so long that. If you were to say, I don't work out, most of the time you wouldn't be lying, right? <laughs> mm. If you're working out once every three weeks. <laughs> so for myself and the type of clients I'm training, I kind of moderate the intensity based on how much they, they're going to work out. So for people who are using us, for instance, because we're their only physical activity, and maybe they're going to work out twice a week, I'm going to moderate the intensity so they can work out productively twice a week. Like, I'm not going to try to drop them so right. that they're sore the second time. And the other thing with, with training too hard, you know, it's one thing if your muscles have to recover. It's another thing if your joints have to recover. You know, it's, a, it's, it's a, if failure looks like your teeth are clenching, your veins are bulging, you know, spits coming out of your mouth, it's more than your muscles that have to recover. So at this time in life, I tend to go a little easier on the intensity. I, th I think the intention, intensity can be managed also. Again, keeping in mind that most of the people I'm dealing with are using me for their physical activity in life. You know, these are not people who are regularly, uh, you know, walking, running, doing sports. If, if they were, I would train them harder once a week. Yeah. I was that kind of physically active person. Well, it's very true. And I'm glad you said that because uh, a lot of people ask me, so what determines once or twice a week or more or less? And I always say, well, depends what else you do outside of here and, and the intensity level and your lifestyle, how much sleep, stress. I mean, there are a lot of variables that I ultimately take into account before we decide what the frequency, intensity, duration Plus, we have to, ends we up to see being. how they respond to the exercise itself. I mean, uh, you know, on its own, I think sometimes – you just you need some time to see how they feel, how they're how they're doing, you know, <laughs> like they're like, oh, well, you know. And as Tim Ryan and I, I've always talked about and, and, and he's, you know, does a lot of research in this area. And that is you know, the genetic component and, 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 the, and, and how we're genetically going to respond to exercise and, and, and people are different in that regard. Or do you feel that pretty much, you know, just work out hard, modulate it to an extent and then move on. Don't overthink it. Uh, I've put in a lot of thought into not overthinking it. <laughs> 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 I put a lot of thought into this and I came to the conclusion, don't overthink it. You know, um, and, and again, why is the person working out? If the person is intent on being a bodybuilder, looking like a bodybuilder, competing as a bodybuilder, then they're going to do something excessive, either with you or without you. <laughs> uh, that's not necessarily the same for the person, you know, the businessman or woman who comes to you and says, you know, I just need to get in shape and it's very vague. And their idea of a hard workout is what you would call a, a break in workout. But their mm -hmm. perception of it is, oh, wow, this is so hard. So um, I'm with you. Yeah, I put a lot of thought into not overthinking it. <laughs> All right, I think I think that's a good place to 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 end this. It was it was perfect. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Thanks again to Bill D. Simone for taking the time to join us once again here on the Inform Fitness Podcast. We will include links in the show notes to Adam, Bill, and Doug's books so you can pick them up in Amazon and have them delivered right to your door. Hey, for those of you who reside near Manhattan, Port Washington. Denville, Burbank, Boulder, Leesburg, and Reston, good news. There's an Inform Fitness near you. Pop on over to informfitness.com to get a glimpse of each location. Better yet, set up a consultation and begin your own journey with the power of 10. Thanks so much for listening. And until next time, for Adam, Mike, and Sheila of Inform Fitness, I'm Tim Edwards with the Inbound Podcasting Network.